Dear guests, dear followers, good morning and welcome to the second day of online Romanian Military Conference 2021. I'm Colonel Mircea Barak, Editor-in-Chief Romanian Military Thinking Magazine, edited by the Defense Staff and your host for this event. For the smooth running of the debate, I would like to highlight a few organizational issues. From a technical point of view, speakers and moderators will, be, will have access to the video camera and microphone options related to the application. The audience will have access only to the listening option. For the Q&A section within the panels, I will kindly ask the participants to send the questions in writing in the public chat section and to mention to whom they address the question. The General Security versus National Security Policy Panel is coordinated by the Integrated Intelligence, Defense and Security Solution an association, an association aimed to promote, supports, develops, and disseminates guidelines, analyzes, policies, and strategies in the area of defense and intelligence. Chair of the panel is Mr. Nikolai, Nikolai Yanku, president and founder of the SAID Association and a national security specialist. He has worked in the field of military research and education, international military cooperation and strategic planning, having relevant expertise on NATO, multinational operations, integrated planning and public policies in the security, defense and intelligence areas. He was rector of the Mihai Vitazul National Intelligence Academy. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Colonel Barak. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here this morning with us. Welcome to the fourth panel of the Romanian Military Thinking Conference 2021. Dear guests, distinguished panelists, dear friends, it is a great pleasure and privilege for me to be here today. And I want to congratulate the organizers for this impressive academic and professional event that successfully brought together security and defense strategies, scholars and experts to discuss and provide opinions and conclusions on the present and future of the Black Sea region. This panel is entitled Regional Security versus National Security in the Black Sea region, Security Provisors and Consumers um, at the Black Sea. Our debate We'll start from the dilemma if the Black Sea region remains or not in the realm of real politics. Ma many relevant analyses from the Euro Atlantic area still conclude that no general security system has been realized in the Black Sea for too many centuries and the Black Sea remained a heterogeneous and divided security region. Furthermore, the Russia-Georgia War of 2008, the illegal annexation of Crimea by the Russian Federation in 2014, and Russia's military intervention in eastern Ukraine have been the major security events that fundamentally altered regional security. Thus, the fundamental assumption is that the Black Sea region is a central source of the rivalry between Russia and the West for democratic future of Europe and Euro-Atlantic stability. Ladies and gentlemen, having set the scene for today's discussion, let me introduce our very welcome, very known, and very esteemed panelists. Major General Viorel Pana. General Pan is chief of the Romanian Air Force staff. He started his military career in 1989 as a fighter pilot on MiG-21 uh, aircraft. He's an instructor pilot on C-130 Hercules and C-27J Spark. General Pan has over 3,000 flying hours logged as an airlift pilot and has participated in more than 200 missions in, in theaters of military operations in Iraq, Afghanistan, Bosnia, and Kosovo, and various humanitarian missions in country and abroad. Dr. Viorel Chibotaru. Dr. Chibotaru is director 
of the European Institute for Political Studies of Moldova and Senior Associate Fellow of the Geneva Center for Democratic Control of the Armed Forces. In 2015, uh, Mr. Chibotaru was Minister of Defense within the Cabinet of Moldova. Dr. Chibotaru holds a PhD in journalism from the Academy of Science of Moldova. He has published many articles and books, mostly on journalism, mass media, national security and defense, conflict and post-conflict management. Mario Blocker. Mr. Blocken is director of the Permanent Secretariat of Finabel. In this role, he is the international representative of the organization. Um, Finabel's primary focus is the study and promotion of uh, interoperability in all its aspects. Mr. Blocken is a member of several permanent EU and NATO working groups and advises various um, international bodies on military cooperation. Professor Dimitrios Triandafilo. He's a professor of international relations and director of the Center for International and European Studies at Kadir Has University in Istanbul. He has written extensively about the politics and security of the Black Sea region. He is co convener of the Commission of the Black Sea and a member of the advisory boards of the Black Sea Trust for Regional Cooperation and the Black Sea NGO Forum. Uh, Professor Gabriel Raiku. Professor Raiku is Vice Rector for Research and Innovation at Constanza Maritime University since 2016. In addition, he is a cybersecurity expert and I would say a cybersecurity enthusiast. He is a lead coordinator of the Black Sea Maritime Cybersecurity Training Center from the Constanza Maritime University. She has an, an, an active academic activity within the university since 1997. Dr. Wright is drafting and, and implementing team leader from the first cybersecurity under the umbrella of the Black Sea Maritime Cybersecurity Training Center. Also, he is the main coordinator for the Black Sea Cybersecurity Conference, now at the fifth edition. Professor Reichel holds a PhD in cybernetics and business informatics. Dr. George uh, Tibil, he is a graduate of the European Security and Defense College and the Faculty of Sociology from the University of Bucharest. He holds a PhD in sociology at the University of Bucharest. In over 30 years of political military career, he has assumed important positions in both national and multinational frameworks such as defense advisor uh, within Romania's permanent delegation to NATO, deputy director for the defense policy and, uh, and advisor to the minister at the Romanian, uh, Romanian uh, MOD. He's the author and uh, co-author of many studies on military sociology, geopolitics and security focused mainly on recent evolutions of the EU and NATO, published in different volumes and scientific uh, journals. Dear panelists, thank you very much for joining this panel in this morning today. Uh, your contribution is very much appreciated. I would kindly ask uh, to have um, 50 to 20, 20 minutes for your presentation. Uh, the talks should be followed by 15 minutes Q&A session. Therefore, I, therefore, I uh, invite the audience to ask questions via chat on this platform, as Colonel uh, Barax mentioned before. So let's start the discussion. Firstly, I will uh, welcome and invite uh, Major General Viorel Pana uh, to address the audience. General Pana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, and good morning again. I would consider this a huge opportunity for the Romanian Air Force to make no well, better known our ideas on this uh, interested, interesting topic. And I will not start before saying that I'm honored to speak in, uh, together with such esteemed uh, thinkers on military sciences. 
Now, the title of this panel, Regional Security versus National Security, very well chosen. I would say better than versus and the national security because these two issues cannot be touched otherwise than together. You cannot think about national security without regional security. Anyhow, I will uh, take this, this topic of today just from the, I would say, unacademically uh, from Romanian Air Force sleepers. I mean, Romanian Air Force perspective on regional security uh, and national security. Next slide, please. Of course, on the time allotted for this is just to express a few ideas uh, as an overview about the air perspective on national and regional security. Next slide, please. Very shortly, I'll touch the deterrence in the Black Sea area, a few words about NATO current posture and Romanian Air Force posture, and of course about our plans to adapt to the security situation near the Black Sea, the days that we are living in. Next slide, please. The Black Sea region is of crucial significance for Europe, being a major crossroads and critical interception of East, West and South North corridors. Many experts believe that whoever controls or dominates the Black Sea can easily project power to the European continent, mainly in the Balkans and Eastern and Central Europe, but also in the Eastern Mediterranean, as well as South Caucasus and Northern Middle East. And the recent events prove that this is the truth. The region is home to three NATO members, Bulgaria, Romania and Turkey, and several NATO partner countries. And as a consequence, whatever actions taken by a rogue actor to cause instability or hostility in the area directly impacts the alliance. Next slide, please. Just for a better picture, the problem in the Black Sea area is not a new one. Different actors through different periods of time tried to impose their will and dominance of this area. The importance of the Black Sea throughout history arose from its geostrategic position. Thus, this represents a bridge between two continents, Asia and Europe, finding itself at the junction of the trade roads and energy flows the Silk Road, the flows of oil and natural gases, and so on. Of course, from the Caspian Sea to the Western Europe. NATO reaffirmed the support offered to the riparian Black Sea states to ensure security, stability in the area, and develop several appropriate strategic directions of action to strengthen and redefine the posture of its military forces. NATO response to illegal seizure of Crimea was to establish a set of deterrence measures to demonstrate the alliance will defend its own population, territory and allied forces against any aggression. Additional measures were also established after the head of state summit in Warsaw in 2016. Next slide, please. Again, after 2014, the region becomes an area of confrontation, both NATO and Russia, applying openly a deterrence policy. On the Black Sea airspace, Russia wants to protect its interests related to maintaining the Crimea Peninsula into the fatherland and is applying pressure not only to Ukraine, but also to all Black Sea states, but at different levels. As such, Russian Federation considers Crimea Peninsula as its naturally and legally owned territory, and it's using it as a military power projection base. In the last years, we could not notice the modernization of Belbek airfield, capable nowadays to of offer proper operating conditions to all types of aircraft belonging to Russian Air Force. 
Moreover, the Crimean A2AD system was developed and accommodates the S-400 surface-to-air systems, fighters, fighter bombers, coastal defense systems, and various jamming systems in a defensive capacity, but also as an offensive line of conduct. Consequently, from the Russian view, the Black Sea is considered as a buffer area with respect to possible confrontation with NATO and the European Union. Russia's approach to diminish the Western influence and to increase own political, economical and military control resulted into an imbalanced power situation in the Black Sea. In the air domains, Russia performs flights with different ISR platforms in order to maintain an accurate situational awareness. Bomber flights in order to show the force and even to train its ability <clears throat> to perform, <clears throat> excuse me. No. Russia performs joint air and naval exercises to train its force against NATO naval presence on the Black Sea. And, of course, Russia's deterrence strategy includes joint missile launch exercises in order to test not only own forces' defensive capacity, but also its offensive line of conduct. All these are military actions and are being presented to the mass media as mirroring actions to the NATO offensive posture on the Black Sea region. Now, <clears throat> I will uh, shortly remind you the importance of Romania's NATO membership with respect to the regional security in the Black Sea area. As all the Black Sea riparian countries are either NATO members or partners, regional security is very much driven by the NATO decisions. <coughs> NATO response to illegal seizure of Crimea was established as a set of deterrence measures to demonstrate the will of the alliance to defend the population, the territory, and the allied forces against any air and missile threat. As the borders with Russia <coughs> lead to a land-oriented deterrence in the north, the Black Sea represents the open space between Russian Federation and NATO, so we may speak about an air and naval-oriented deterrence in the southeast. NATO response consists of AWACS aircraft, routinely flights performed in order to enhance the air surveillance and the early warnings about Russian forces movement of enhanced ISR flights performed by Global Hawk, U-2, <coughs> and RC-135 aircraft. Moreover, as a response to the catch incident, JFC Naples, rehearse different action orders to train NATO troops to be able to offer adequate posture. The air policing capability of the Alliance on the region was enhanced through Allied fighter detachments deployed on Romanian and Bulgarian air bases. The posture of the air policing forces is purely defensive, being directed to address any flights that do not respect international rules of navigation and conduct. Other aspects of NATO air deterrence measures include deployments of fighters or multi-role aircraft, SAM and the Air-C2 systems in order to exercise air defense tactics, techniques and procedures, support to the Allied naval presence on the Black Sea with P-3 and P-8 aircraft capable to perform maritime surveillance and anti-submarine reconnaissance missions. Next slide, please. <clears throat> as NATO, NATO member and at the same time a country with 250 kilometers borders represented by the Black Sea, Romania took the necessary actions to demonstrate a real deterrence capability and to prove that it is a security provider in the area. With respect to the Air Force, we've increased our operational capability by the latest new acquisition programs, 
such as the multi-role aircraft and the long-range surface-to-air Patriot missile systems. Moreover, after the implementation of the enhanced forward presence in the northeastern part of the Alliance and the tailored forward presence in the southeastern part of the Alliance covering the Black Sea region, the Air Combined Training Initiative, ACTI, concept was created and implemented, allowing for different exercises to be developed and executed. I'll give just a few examples, Blue Bridge, Thracian Star, or Anatolian Phoenix, Dacian Viper. There were their air assets and personnel participation from different NATO members, where CAD, combat air support, recce missions, all were executed under NATO Early Warning Aircraft Command and control or under the command and control of a deployable CRC. In addition to active concept, different detachments belonging to Canada, Italy, Portugal, Spain and Great Britain were deployed to Romania starting with the spring of 2017 to execute the enhanced air policing along with Romanian Air Force. Next slide, please. <clears throat> of course, we will continue to increase our operational capability through the multi-role fighter aircraft procurement program projected to achieve a final operational air capability represented by three multi-role fighter squadrons equipped with fifth generation F-35. Through a transition period covered by three F-16 squadrons. Up to now, we succeeded to declare operational the first squadron and to procure the maintenance simulator. A further important major acquisition program was triggered when the decision was made to procure the long range surface to air Patriot missile system with the aim to increase our capacity to defend the national airspace and the vital and strategic military and civilian critical assets. First Patriot system was delivered in September 2020, and we also managed to modernize part of our Puma helicopters to M version to upgrade the IAR-99 Hawk combat training jet to IAR-99 Super Hawk and to procure the long-range radars, PPS-77. In the near future, it is in our intent to start other endowment programs to include the acquisition of UAVs, electronic warfare systems, C4 ISR systems or Shorad V Shorad systems to continue modernize our assets in order to shape a new architecture design for our air defensive posture and to enhance our contribution to the Alliance missions. Another aspect aimed by Romanian Air Forces is to build a better integration at the level of the Allied Air Forces and at the level of the other services in the Army. We need to keep pace with the new security environment and the asymmetrical challenges and our equipment needs to have the embedded flexibility to be capable of adapting to future demands and to comply with the operational requirements of a capable Air Force. Next slide, thank you. To conclude, the Romanian Air Force is effectively contributing to Homeland Security by safeguarding the national airspace. Of course, doing so is contributing and provides for the regional security and for NATO security. We will continue to upgrade and consolidate our combat capabilities with a view of defending our nation and rule of law values and respecting the commitments made by our country at the international level to bolster regional and alliance security. That concludes my presentation, gentlemen. Thank you very much for your Thank you very much, General Sir, for your very welcome and thoughtful presentation. Um, I would conclude uh, your key points at the end of this panel. So, um, therefore, I um, 
would move to the next speaker now, Dr. Violet Chibotaru, uh, to provide his presentation. Dr. Chibotaru, the floor is yours. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference for inviting me. It's uh, my privilege to speak in this uh, distinguished uh, uh, auditorium. And uh, of course, uh, it's uh, difficult to say uh, when uh, think about the uh, Republic of Moldova that the Republic of Moldova can be at the moment uh, a real provider for security. So we rather think about Moldova as a, a big consumer of the security. And it's understandable. Small states uh, which, which uh, face uh, economic, political, security and demographic challenges such as uh, the Republic of Moldova cannot and uh, will not be able to cope on their own. Hence, the key questions to be answered are what geopolitical context can Moldova ensure a sufficient level of defense and security in accordance uh, with its European aspirations? What security options should or could Moldova take advantage of? Unfortunately, Moldova has insufficiently used the international partnership to strengthen its resilience against the uh, effects of multiple crises. The current situation, therefore, dictates uh, the need for a new national security and defense concept to be formulated by the new political leaders in their aspiration to access uh, power and to govern Moldova, which uh, happened uh, this year. Uh, at the all levels, uh, I mean uh, the presidency, the parliament, and uh, the government established by a new majority. Uh, to answer uh, these questions regarding the essence of the new Moldova security and defense policy, it is imperative to review traditional and emerging issues, risks, and threats, but also to identify the optimal formula in advance uh, new, uh, and advance new topics of uh, national interest taking into account the latest development and experiences in the field of national security. Moreover, it is worth encouraging and promoting the process of strategic planning and modeling of a future defense and security policy, which shall include the terms of uh, resilience to unconventional hybrid proxy and information wars. This process shall anticipate the effects and impact of the development of smart defense, artificial intelligence, outsourcing, cyber resilience, and uh, early warning technologies. It is a special task not only for the authorities, officials from ministries and agencies, members of parliament, but also for civil society, academia, the community of experts, uh, and uh, of course, uh, the media. Methodologically, the new strategic concepts of the leadership of the Republic of Moldova must be developed in consensus with the integrated European approach to foreign security and defense policy. The association agreement with the European Union, but also the current framework for international cooperation in the field of defense and security with NATO and its member states creates important opportunities in this regard that must be sized. Finally, the reform of the security sector calls for the need to develop and explore the system of international agreements and cooperation with NATO and its partners, with a special focus on relations with Romania and Ukraine, it, there's uh, both uh, uh, neighbors of the uh, Republic of Moldova, but of course also with the United States and Western European states that can provide political diplomatic, strategic, and defense support in the case of a larger strategic security threats against Moldova. Uh, it is well known that the rapprochement with the European Union and the implementation of Moldova's commitments under the association agreement are an essential to the component of national security as well. Unfortunately, Moldova's credibility with the European Union has dropped massively due to lack of reforms and stagnation uh, in last years. In this respect, a major effort is needed to increase the credibility of the Moldovan authorities in relation to its external partners and their own citizens. This can only be achieved by accelerating reforms, promoting and supporting a new pro-reform political elite. The fight against corruption, the independence of the judiciary and the rule of law are key conditions for ensuring Moldova's economic security and unblock its relations with the European Union, which is happening right now. 
Likewise, relations with Romania are extremely important in terms of European integration, military and security cooperation, Moldova being today on the border with the European Union and NATO. During the pandemic crisis, Romania has once again demonstrated that it is most important partner, which can provide unconditional and immediate assistance to the Republic of Moldova. In the nearest future, it will also be necessary to make the most of Moldova relations with NATO, in particular, exploring the support for strengthening defense capabilities, reform and train the army and national security structures. The partnership with NATO is focused on identifying and using all viable mechanisms to strengthen the state's defense capacity. The key objectives of the new security architecture needs are uh, reflected in the updated bilateral cooperation framework, for example, the Individual Partnership Action Plan, IPAP, Moldova, NATO, and the Partnership Analysis and Review Process part. From the list of security arguments which conditions which, which condition and reflect the degree of strengthening of this partnership, it is worth mentioning Moldova's participation in the two uh, initiatives, Interoperability Platform and Defense Capability Building Initiative. No less important is the deployment of the national contingent to the NATO CHI-4 mission in Kosovo, which is uh, possible thanks to the support of the governments of Italy and the United States. And uh, recently, just a few days ago, the Moldovan government uh, uh, has decided to deploy a new contingent of uh, Moldovan uh, peacekeepers in uh, Liban uh, next year. Uh, the Partnership for Peace uh, will remain the strong point of the alliance's policies toward its partners, including Moldova, uh, although its uh, potential needs to be fully exploited and implemented more effectively. Thus, the PFP contribution to the security and defense reform process in the Republic of Moldova has been and should continue to be extremely important for the Ministry of Defense and other uh, defense agencies. Uh, in uh, this regard, uh, uh, concluding my uh, presentation, I would uh, uh, present you a few my own uh, proposals to how uh, this role of Moldova uh, uh, to transform it from consumer to provider of the security can be achieved, at least partially for, for the moment being, uh, if Moldova should uh, fully explore the potential of its relations with NATO and the European Union within the existing partnership framework and agreements aimed at strengthening defense capabilities, reform and train the national army, increasing resilience and capabilities to identify and respond to conventional and hybrid interference, reform and empowering the national intelligence and security system, uh, strengthening the cooperation with the United States in the process of security sector review is a key. Moldova should negotiate the uh, setup arrangements of a special uh, uh, setup of a special arrangements in the framework of uh, strategic dialogue with the United States, focus on strengthening the defense and security cooperation. The new security and defense strategic framework should include the aim to further strengthen the cooperation with other countries in the region, members and aspirants to become NATO members. In this respect, Moldova needs to strengthen its security and defense partnership with Ukraine and Georgia, countries that today are more advanced in terms of policies, capabilities and experience in the defense and security sector. The European Union associated status of all three countries provides uh, for an extensive framework and opportunities related uh, to strengthening resilience, cybersecurity, and contracting uh, hybrid interference. Moldova should strengthen and expand its strategic defense partnership with Romania, in particular by uh, first concluding a bilateral agreement on mutual assistance in case of direct hostile actions against the Republic of Moldova of a terrorist hybrid, cybernetic or other nature, creating joint conventional military forces at battalion then brigade level, such as the Poland-Ukrainian battalions, Pol Okrabat, or the joint brigade created by Lithuania, Poland and Ukraine, lit pol uh, Brig, extending, strengthening and institutionalizing relations on the dimension of civil protection and creating joint units. Creating joint units 
I would call it fleet in the Danube Delta in double subordination of the Ministry of Defense of Republic of Moldova and Border Police with mixed military civilian missions. And uh, of course, if uh, we're speaking uh, uh, about Romania, for example, developing relations in the field of defense industry, especially with the state company Romtechnica, creating joint enterprises to produce ammunition and repair of military equipment. This is just a first, uh, uh, a very short uh, list uh, of uh, what should Moldova uh, uh, do in this regard to become, uh, to become and to develop its role as a, a relevant uh, uh, actor, player in the regional context. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, Mr. Uh, Minister. Uh, we are grateful for the time and effort uh, you took to share your thoughts and experience with our panel. And now I move to the next speaker today, Mr. Mario Blocken, to provide his presentation. Uh, Mr. Blocken, the floor is yours. We can hear you, Thank sir. You very much. Yeah, sir. yeah, it works. Um, I would like to have the opportunity to uh, share my slideshow. So someone for, from the organizers, if you can help Mr. Blocken to share his presentation, please. If there is someone from the organizers here, please. Hello, Mr. Blocken. You can share your screen now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Blocken, are you still here with us, here? I think Mr. Blocken has lost the connection. Okay. Um, I think that we could move forward, hoping to have Mr. Blocken again with us here. Um, yes. So, I would suggest to go to the next speaker now. Um, is, uh, is, uh, um, I will give the floor to the next speaker, Professor Dimitri Ostrianda Filou. Dimitri, if you can hear me. Uh, yes, I, yes okay. I can. Thank you very yes, much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Niku, for uh, the invitation and, uh, and to the organizers as well for, for uh, inviting me to take part in this uh, very interesting panel and sharing the floor, floor with Major General Pana and, uh, and Minister Chibotaru and others. Uh, I'll give a more uh, sort of academic uh, presentation. I don't have a PowerPoint. Um, 
I mean, I, what I do with the Black Sea as, as an analyst, as, a, as, as an academic, and as someone who, who writes and thinks about the wider issues, I just take a big picture. So if, if we look at the big picture, over the last uh, in a, you know, 30 years, we have ample evidence of what's happening in the Black Sea since the end of the Cold War. But in particular, over the last 20 years, we also have ample evidence, and it's part of our concern, and you can see this also in the presentations of the two previous speakers, of, of um, an, an, a Russian military modernization, which is having an impact uh, on, on Black Sea dynamics. Uh, and, and linked to that, uh, and we saw some of the maps that show the impact and the involvement of Russia, there's also um, military modernization, which is complemented or supplemented or goes hand in hand with, with um, the growth of hybrid threats, uh, non-conventional threats in the cyber realm and, and the information uh, realms, um, the weaponization of energy, uh, and it's not just a Black Sea issue, it's a wider issue. And I think one of the things we need to do also is focus a bit beyond, not just focus on the Black Sea. And I'll get to this in a second. So weaponization of energy supplies, weaponization of migration. Um, part of it is actually in evidence right now on the border between Poland and Belarus. And then, of course, even uh, over the course of the year in the summer between Belarus and some of the Baltic states. Violation. Uh, of, of sovereignty and sovereign rights of neighbors and um, de facto reincorporation of, of Belarus into Russia. So, so we have all these things. These are trends that are very real and they've changed the dynamics and, and the balance of power in, in the region. And, and we can sum these up as, as uh, evidence of Russian revisionism. Uh, and we can get into a debate as to why Russia is doing this also, but um, this is what seems to be part of the issue. Simultaneously, though, we have other trends as well. We have a, a disarmament uh, of many, many e, uh, EU member states, if not a majority. Only now, over the last few years, is there a debate to the need to focus more on defense. Um, and, 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 and this is also something very real. Maybe not so much in the case of states like Romania or my country, Greece, that are flank states that have external borders with threats or threat enhanced threat perceptions, and therefore um, they, they have no choice but to invest into their defense. But, but it's happening among our partners and allies, and this is something to consider. There's also another trend. There's a growing dissonance with the NATO fellow member uh, and EU accession candidate Turkey. Uh, an increased divergence uh, or uh, an increasingly autonomous Turkey and, and uh, which we have to take this into account. While in the past we used to talk about Russia and the West in general in the region, maybe now there's sort of a triangular relationship uh, because even the West, we are having our own divisions among ourselves. And we have to take this into account and this has an impact therefore, uh, I think on the strategic uh, outlook um, and, and, and the strategic prerogatives of each side. There's a gridlock European Union. I just came back from a three-day research trip to the EU and EU institutions. Came back late last night as part of another research project where uh, myself together with a number of Greek uh, colleagues and Turkish colleagues, we are looking at Turkey as a partner in challenge of European security. And then when we talk to, 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 to uh, commission, the gridlock is there. You have uh, EU officials wanting to do more. That's why they're there to promote uh, EU foreign policy and security policy and defense policy. But the EU is gridlocked. And part of it is because of growing dissonance among EU member states. And I think there's also something that we never consider so much when we talk about the Black Sea. But I think we need to consider, in particular, when we think in EU terms and, and you know, whether one is Romanian or Greek, but even Moldovan that somehow, Moldova that somehow linked is, is uh, the Germany issue. There is the absence of Germany as a foreign policy actor uh, as, uh, and because Germany is key in terms of the motor of integration within the European Union together with France and Germany stressing more national prerogatives over EU prerogatives and, and you can see this in its approach with, with Russia and the Nord Stream 2 uh, and so on uh, and, and therefore not taking the lead necessarily 
to provide for or to account or to take into account strategic developments that, that are happening that have an impact on other EU member states in, in this part of the world is something to consider. But there's a gridlock EU in general. Uh, differences on a number of issues which makes EU foreign policy making very difficult when we know of course that foreign policy is made in the national capitals and not necessarily in the EU institutions and so this is something to consider there's also another trend which is we still are not very clear about the impact and and uh, it would have but this is the growing Chinese economic presence and so what this would have especially if if uh, the Chinese investments are targeted at as strategic assets such as ports and others. I mean, there's a big debate in my country about the Port of Piraeus and this Chinese investment, which on the one hand makes sense for countries that need investment, but on the other hand, in terms of the wider picture, uh, it's something to consider. There's also this growing arc, and that's why I'm saying we should not focus only on the Black Sea per se, but, but a growing arc linkage between, say, the Caspian Sea, the Black Sea, the Aegean, the Eastern Mediterranean, and the Middle East. And we have to consider, I live and work uh, in Istanbul and, um, you know, um, one sees through the straits every day. I have a colleague, I have a colleague uh, uh, in my department who is an avid historian and also takes a lot of photos with friends and photos of uh, Russian ships and submarines going from the Black Sea into into uh, the Aegean and, 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 and vice versa, the growing number of this is happening shows the link that we have to consider. So the Black Sea on its own as a unit of analysis, of course, is valid, but maybe we need to widen this. And I'll get this in a second too, because it comes down to the issue of being security providers. And I, uh, I'll talk about this. And also differences between EU and uh, NATO member states, even in the region. Um, um, first, if we take Romania and Bulgaria, uh, Romania has made a commitment for decades now to where it belongs and, and how it views its, its security and defense as part of the West, of uh, the EU and so on. Bulgaria is committed, but I would say that uh, maybe it's, it's more, um, as a smaller and maybe weaker country, it, it's also liable at times to, to have... Uh, doubts and credibility and you can see this in some polls about the value of this involvement while on the other hand too um, one looks in a number of analysis that uh, uh, Romania and Turkey have uh, close links and understanding because of at least of a common threat on the other hand there is also competition between the two because if we think about uh, you know strategic assets in both countries and what the trend is right now to enhance Romanian strategic assets uh, as part of uh, NATO's uh, forward defense and other strategies in the region or even the EU's, uh, well, this is not something that necessarily would make Ankara happy. So there is a normal competition as well for regional leadership, which might have an impact on, on, on the developments. Apart from this, there's also, I think, in, in the literature, as academics, we talked about an aspect of security called ontological security. And, and, and there's a paradigm and a dimension. It, looks, it goes back to how we are shaped as, as uh, citizens of our countries, our histories, how we view others historically. And, and this culture is also impacting on our ability to uh, It's happening, for example, between my country, Greece and Turkey. Uh, some of the differences can be attributed to that aspect, which enhances the lack of trust, right, between two allies that joined NATO together almost 70 years ago in 1952. And nevertheless, we've always felt as outliers, as flank states, and, and, and with a feeling of isolation many times uh, um, uh, that others do not understand us, be it Greece or Turkey, but a lot of it comes from ontological security dimensions and paradigms, and I think some of them are also reflected among Black Sea literal states, which we have to consider. And then also uh, the limits, and this is also relevant in terms of security and strategy, because there's also the normative element, the normative element of values and norms, and, and growing talk and evidence of the limits of, uh, of liberal democracy. And, and what this means, because ultimately, if we talk about the regional security framework or 
not not necessarily regional. It, it does not include all the literal states, uh, since Russia cannot really be included in what we are talking about. Um, the, the differences um, uh, between us, uh, between NATO member states, uh, uh, has an impact in terms of the normative element as being part of the glue that binds also NATO member states together. It's not just security per se, but others. So, so in all of this, the questions that arise in this uh, trend over the last 20 years, and I've just raised some of the issues and we can have a discussion about, about uh, this and what other ones are out there. Uh, you know, it made me think as, uh, you know, what are NATO's interests ultimately? And are they universally shared? And this is part of the issue that comes out of it among EU members and uh, NATO member states. Likewise, what are they use interests and, uh, and uh, are they universally shared? Um, and I'll talk about the EU in a second as well, because we tend to forget the EU as a security actor, but I think it's relevant for EU member states not to forget that. So, so in this sense, therefore, this, what sort of resilience, right, which is, is a societal, which is in terms of security, which is economic, and so on, so, so do we need? And, 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 there is, and I think what we need, especially as, as uh, uh, countries, uh, whether literal states or, or countries of the wider Black Sea region, because I understand uh, uh, why, uh, in, in particular, uh, Major General Panya was talking about the literal states, in particular the six countries, but I think the Black Sea region is greater than this. Uh, um, uh, so, so we need something to move beyond balancing Russia into more holistic, proactive approach. Um, because balancing Russia means, in a way, reacting to uh, this growing Russian threat, which is much, much uh, in evidence, uh, at least since 2008, if not before. But 2008, with both uh, the war in, in Georgia and later on with uh, the annexation, occupation of Crimea and, and, and Donbass and so on and so forth. Um, uh, we, we, we need to move beyond the label of, uh, that we seek as states of the region from uh, bigger stakeholders such as the US that we are reliable allies to, to actually being security providers. And, and, and then being a security provider, also we need to discuss what this means. Is it a security provider just in our immediate neighborhood or we need to be security providers for the wider European security context and dealing with uh, uh, wider uh, EU security issues. I mean, there's a big debate, for example, in my country. Again, I'll bring it out. Greece recently signed a bilateral defense agreement with France, and, and it got a lot of hoopla. But the interesting part of the debate is that I think is Article 18 out there, which for the first time, uh, Greece has always been very worried about taking part in operations out of area. Uh, the Sahel is mentioned that Greece has understood the Greek establishment that if it wants to be seen as a security provider, it has to play a role as long with, along with many other European countries in the Sahel. And the Sahel is not France's backyard. It's the EU's backyard. It has to do with uh, the, the fight against global terrorism. And, and therefore, a security provider means uh, being ready and willing to, to, to send the troops uh, uh, to face danger uh, in defense of uh, European values and, 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 and norms and security. And eventually, beyond moving, uh, becoming a security provider is also, how do you set the agenda, being agenda setters? Um, and also the setters. And, and, see, and, and in this sense, we need to not forget our linkages to the European Union, because yes, and the EU has made remarkable progress over the last 30 years since the Treaty of Maastricht, since the end of the Cold War, in terms of having a common foreign and security policy and, 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 and uh, right now uh, an ESDP, uh, European, uh, CSDP common security and defense policy, and, and has put them in treaty form, in particular in the Treaty of Lisbon, where we have you know, the permanent structure cooperation, the PESCO mechanism, and before that we've had the battle groups and none of them have really moved forward. But if we don't provide, we, and when I say we, I talk about us as regional states, and I make an extension, even though uh, I'm giving 
uh, I'm an independent analyst, I make a projection of what I would like for my country and I think what uh, others would like for their country, be it Romania, or Bulgaria or Moldova, is what is our contribution to strengthen exactly these instruments and these policies that have not really moved forward. We belong to them, for example, even battle groups, we are all part of this uh, Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, and now it's enhanced to Ukraine and Serbia, the Helbrock, the Hellenic Brigade, battle group, yes, it's uh, there for training, but how do we give beef to it and link this also It seems that the connection was lost. Uh, let's wait, wait just for 30 seconds. And if uh, um, Professor Kandafilu would not be able to join us again, I will move to the next speaker. Dimitri, can you hear me? Hello, uh, yes? can you hear me? Yes, yes, it was, uh, yeah. You have the floor, please. Uh, Dimitri, we can hear you. If you want, please continue. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you, Dimitri. Can you hear us? Dimitri, can you hear us? Hello? Yes? We can hear you. Just let me send him um, a brief message. Hello? Yes, just a second. Hello, Dimitri, can you hear me? Um, yes, yes. I think, yes, now I can hear you again. Sorry, I don't know. I, I realized at some stage that uh, everything was frozen and I was yes, not sure. But, but just for a couple of minutes, no more okay. than a minute anyway. All right, All right. Okay. so let me, may, may let me quickly try to finish. So yeah. I'm just say, I was just saying that we need to also focus on, on what the EU is doing and actually strengthen that instead of uh, because given the gridlock, it's easy to say nothing is working, but I think if we don't contribute as member states and a lot of these initiatives, in particular the PESCO initiative and the battle groups, and, and even putting substance and meat to Article 42.7, uh, which is about the mutual defense clause, who cannot happen without us as a particular state with external frontiers facing threats fellow uh, partners and allies that we need to do this. And I think therefore narrowing only the discussion on Black Sea security to what is happening within, uh, between the six literal states uh, uh, of the Black Sea region is not good for, for, uh, for countries such as ours, I, countries that belong are either literal states or part of the wider definition of the Black Sea. And, and this is where other initiatives, be it the 3SI initiative, is something to consider and expand because of its economic dimension. Um, I know I've, I've been reading a lot of analysis. Uh, for example, there's one suggestion for six plus one dialogue to be enhanced, which is six literal states, uh, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, uh, 
Ukraine, uh, Georgia, uh, uh, well, together, well, with Moldova, which is not a literal state, uh, and, and so on, with the US. But I think we need to increase this to make it a seven plus one, where at least Greece should also be in this in the sense that we can even see right now with the, the emphasis on the port of Alexandrupoli in Greece, which is a strategic asset to move equipment and troops to help the security and defense of, of Bulgaria and Romania uh, on the part of the US and so on, or to enhance the dialogue even wider to other countries, North Macedonia maybe, uh, uh, as well, uh, to, to try to bring in countries uh, that, that are not necessarily uh, EU member states, but, um, but, but have, uh, have an interest in being linked with us. And also in that sense, uh, the EU two that were mentioned before that are EU literal states, but also I think EU three, uh, Romania, Bulgaria and Greece also need to enhance the relationship. Something which has not, even though we, we do have trilaterals, they have not advanced as much as they should be doing. I mean, I was involved for a long time in the activities of BSEC uh, as director of the International Center for Black Sea Studies, uh, the, the research uh, think tank of, of the BSEC. And, and this is one of the things where at times there was this trilateral cooperation, which allowed us as three then to talk, bring in Turkey as an accession partner, and then create a strategy and a policy towards the other countries as well. But many other times, this thing has failed to, to deliver. Uh, so in order to become real security providers, we need to think, I think, outside the box. The trends are what they are. We cannot fight them. Uh, Russia is becoming more revisionist. There is this dissonance with Turkey, which we have to take into account. Yes, Turkey cannot be lost. Absolutely, it needs to be part of the alliance. But there's the reality that it's also moving away. And, and so the relationship has changed from Russia and the West to something else, which, which other, other uh, regional states have to take into account. And therefore, it is the obligation of other countries, such as Romania, such as Bulgaria, such as Greece, uh, and others, to try also to, to integrate uh, together with the Americans and, and within the European Union, uh, 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 the, the, the other countries that want to come closer to us and to enhance our security. So I'll stop here. And uh, I know my presentation has been much uh, a bit different from that of my predecessors, but I think this is sort of the academic uh, output that I can provide and I'm ready to take in uh, your questions and comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kenda Filil, for your presentation. Um, I very much appreciate the time and effort you took to share your thoughts and the great experience in the Black Sea Matters with our panel today. I've been taking a lot of notes uh, from your uh, presentation and I'm going to share with our audience at the end of this panel some of them just to invite them to um, to come into the discussion within the Q&A session. And now I'll, I'll move to the next speaker, Mr. Mario Blocken. Um, sorry for, the, any, uh, for any inconvenience before, and I'm inviting you to, to provide your presentation. So Mr. Blocken, the floor is yours. Uh, oh, 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 um, turn on your microphone. Okay, thank you. Online there. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me to share the Finable Insights at this conference. It is an honor to be here and congratulations for the excellent organization. Let's start with a general set the scene moment. For centuries, the Black Sea region has been an important body of water for the region, from access to the Mediterranean Sea to fisheries, and uh, today for the region's country and surrounding areas, the Black Sea represents a major strategic asset. Countries and regions rely on the pipelines and fiber optic cables laid on the seabed, and the straits and the right of passage represent a major issue not only for military reasons, but also mostly for daily trade amongst nations. Over the last decade, the Black Sea region has known multiple tensions and some leading to full-fledged armed conflicts, such as the 2014 illegal annexation of the Crimea and its consequences for Ukraine's sovereignty and control on the Black Sea and its neighboring country. 
This presentation will try to analyze from a European perspective what challenges exist around the Black Sea. Let us first focus on the Eastern Partnership Program, more specifically the partnership with two of the six partners countries, Ukraine and Georgia, both bordering on Black Sea. Although the EAP is not mainly focused on security policy, it does represent significant time, effort and financial investment from the European Union. The EU's goals for this partnership are to support these countries in achieving global policy objectives like the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and the UN 30, 2030 Goals for Sustainable Development. Increasing the stability, prosperity and resilience of these countries will undoubtedly help the EU foster a closer and better relationship with its neighbours. For 2025, the top 10 targets has been selected and some of the more salient targets are increased investment in these countries' economies, focus on the respect of the rule of law, sustainable energy and security and cyber resilience. With the EAP, cybersecurity is expected to rapidly develop a proper framework for identifying and tackling threats to better prepare for a future where these threats are not only increased but rapidly evolve. When looking at EU relations with the Black Sea region, another important policy initiative is the Black Sea Synergy launched in 2008. This initiative aims to focus on and push for further investments in the region to develop and increase better cooperation amongst the region's countries and the EU. The partnerships primarily focus on the environment, the transport, the energy, and more recently, maritime policy. The synergy is supposed to make cooperation between the concerned actors easier, more flexible, and more coherent, maximizing positive outcomes for each party. A third important initiative, the Three Seas Initiative, includes 12 EU member states two of which are on the Black Sea. The initiative gathers the states surrounding the Baltic, Black and Adriatic Seas. Although these countries are for the most part culturally distinct, they do share a common story, that of impeded development, growth and cooperation for the better part of the 20th century, the Iron Curtain. Today, the Three Seas Initiative tries to counter the Iron Curtain's negative impact on these countries. From railroads to pipelines, the countries in Three Seas Initiative remain disconnected from each other, as well as the other Western EU countries. Trying to eliminate the deficits between Western and Eastern Europe has been a goal toward which the EU has thrived. When considering the Black Sea, one important aspect is energy, especially for the EU. The Black Sea is a region with immense potential for energy production and transportation. A paper published in CAPS Policy Inside by Kustova and Egenhofer explains how beneficial Black Sea offshore wind power could be for the EU climate ambitions. In total, the Black Sea has the potential to generate 435 gigawatt of offshore power with a significant percentage of this possible on Romania and Bulgarian waters. However, this potential can only be achieved is if there is regional access and proper governance of the waters. Offshore winds produced by the two member states alone could reach 100 gigawatt and could help reduce the continent dependency on increasingly expensive and inefficient coal. The investment in low carbon energies also means there will be a significant increase in employment surrounding the region's energy sector, further pushing economic growth and development. 
the number of maritime security threats is increasing worldwide and become more complex every day in the geopolitical areas that directly impact EU security and prosperity. However, for a long time, maritime security and hence naval power has been put on the back burner by most EU member states. Yet, in this ever-changing context, if the EU wants to maintain its access, it must change this status quo. The strategic compass to be published in March 2022 by the European External Action Services should detail how the EU can develop its naval power in an effective and efficient way to keep and defend its interests. For some of these interests are the Black Sea region. As previously discussed, Access to this body of water is not only important for good transportation, but also for military operations. And Russia notoriously makes use of the annexed Crimea ter territory for their Russian Black Sea fleet to supply their military actions in Libya and Syria. Let's take a look at the peripheral organizations. The Black Sea has uh, always represented an important crossroads between different economies and wildest cultures. For instance, it is the geographical place where, where Europe, Asia and the Middle East meet and is also a region rich in gas pipelines and fiber optic cables. However, for the large portion of the 20th century, the Black Sea has mostly been under Tsarist and Soviet control. As a matter of fact, on the eve of World War I, 50% of all Russian exports and 90% of Russian agricultural exports passed through the Bosporus form the Black Sea. The potential control of the Russian Empire first and the Soviet state later took a toll on the potential development of the region, both economically and commercially. And due to these conditions, the Black Sea was considered a Soviet lake, since only Turkey was autonomous state, although it joined NATO in 1952. Let's uh, focus more on NATO. Although Turkey joined the NATO in 1952, the Black Sea has only recently become a crucial hotspot for NATO. Romania and Bulgaria joined NATO in 2004, but Ukraine and Georgia also developed strong ties with the organization, as they mainly experienced the rise of Russian assertiveness in the region. Among all liberal states, three are NATO members, two are rebel, the rebel partners, while the remaining one is the Russian Federation. By far the strongest and most aggressive state. Since being appointed president of Russia, Vladimir Putin has always aimed to restore influence over former Soviet territories and halt the EU-Atlantic integration process towards the East. In this context, the peak of Russian aggression is represented by the annexation of the Crimea by force. To the detriment of Ukraine in 2014, this act showed the strategic aims of the Russian Federation, both in terms of politics and security. First, it strengthened Russia's presence in the sea and accordingly in the Mediterranean Sea because it is Russia's only warm port. However, the upgrades in the region provided Russia a platform for regional power pro projection from which long-range cruise missiles and coastal defense systems can more effectively threaten Western forces throughout the Black Sea and to some extent beyond. Russia's military actions seem to confirm the will to create an anti-access area denial zone in the Black Sea, as stated by the Russian chief of the general staff, General Valery Gerasimov, a few years ago. Russia has installed a self-contained military formation in Crimea consisting of a naval base, an army corps, and an aviation and air defense division. Since then, NATO has multiplied its efforts to balance and check Russian aggression. 
decisive step in that region in, in that direction was taken in 2015 and in 2016. In December 2015, NATO and Romania decided to initiate the Bucharest HQ of NATO's multinational division Southeast, with two force integration units attached to it. Located in six Eastern European countries, these relatively small command and control units play an outsized role for NATO, since their primary mission is to speed the deployment of NATO's very high readiness joint task force into frontline Europe in the event of a military crisis. In other words, the Bucharest HQ will be able to command troops deployed to NATO Southeast Division to ensure the implementation of NATO's readiness action plan. A second decisive measure was taken in July 2016 when the head of states and government of uh, member countries gathered in Warsaw. There, they declared NATO's commitment and resoluteness to strengthen the security of NATO countries in the Black Sea region by developing a tailored forward presence in the southeast point of the Alliance territory. The Romanian initiative to establish a multinational framework brigade to help improve integrating training of Allies units under headquarters, multinational division southeast. As stated in the Warsaw Summit communique, this move will contribute to the Alliance strength, deterrence, and defense posture, situational awareness, of course, as well as uh, the peacetime demonstration of NATO's intent to operate without constraint. Another organization which I want to shed a light on is the OSCE. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe is the world's largest security organization. Established in 1973, the OSCE includes 57 member states in North America, Europe, and Asia that work to promote stability, peace, and democracy for more than a billion people. There are some ongoing missions that are shown here on the slide. And the third one that I wanted to talk about is the Black Sea Economic Corporation. It is the Black Sea's largest economic and political organization, representing a region of more than 340 million people on two continents. Established in June 92, it is now comprised of 13 member states. The BSEC primarily devotes its effort to foster interaction and harmony amongst its members, as well as to ensure peace, stability, and prosperity. Over the years, the organization has expanded the fields of cooperation, including the agriculture, banking and finance, and also the institutional renewal and good governments. When we uh, talk about the issues and um, when we talk about the actors, well, within the Black Sea region, a range of actors are views for control and objective aims securing. The tumultuous geopolitical nexus offers a range of security challenges and impediments towards regional consensus building. As these actors maneuver to secure holdings, these challenges are uneventfully heightened with region tensions. Both nation states and multinational entries aim to achieve oftentimes contradictory or divergent goals, which reflect the rising security challenges faced by conventional militaries operating within the region. Through a case study breakdown of analysis, these pivotal actors will be assessed in accordance with their aims, strategic capabilities, and regional political stance. Due to the limited speaking time of 20 minutes, I'm not able to go into depth on these subtopics, but my research team have written them down in a food for thought paper that I will send to you via the organization. When it comes to the main issues in the Black Sea area, uh, we uh, defined certain security strategies 
which based on uh, the main issues that are taking place. Friction in the region depends mainly on the unique geostrategic spot, and it is collocated between Europe and Asia. Taking control of the Black Sea is fundamental for access to the Caspian Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, the Persian Gulf, and the Middle East, as it represents the maritime border between the Western countries and Russia. The Black Sea is a playground for numerous interests and therefore presents a variety of securitization dilemma. This part of the presentation will focus on the main economic and military issues, analyzing the motives that create both hostile and cooperative trends in the region. I list here the security strategies and the main issues related to this. So the Black Sea gives Russia access to the Mediterranean Sea, countries of Cyprus, Egypt, Israel, Libya, and Turkey. Uh, concerning its military access, Russia has a comparative advantage to military operations in the Black Sea together with Turkey. Through the annexation of Crimea in 2014, Russia's intentions in the region became clear. The establishment of a, route, of a route for military activities, the willingness to counter the Western countries' presence in the area, and the economic revenue from gas supply to the littoral country of Turkey, plus the Balkans and some other parts of Europe. Russia's offensive military capability development in April 2021, and the recent example of increased military activities in the area. These large military exercises involved 100,000 Russian battalions along the border with Ukraine and Crimea, and they led the international community to be afraid of a new offensive in the Donbas. Furthermore, Russia has deliberately violated international law by unilaterally stopping access to foreign state vessels in the Sea of Azov and Kerch Strait. In general, anti Ukraine military and commercial actions are threatening the security of all littoral countries. Romania is the most active country amongst those in the alliance, as well as the most determined to have a stronger NATO response in the region. Accordingly, Romania has implemented various military activities, such as the first NATO surface-to-air missile system and the multinational NATO exercises codified as Sea Shield 21. Bulgaria is a NATO member, but its military capability is way less modernized if compared to Romania. The modernization of these countries' warfare capabilities is not a priority for NATO, if compared uh, to this. Since Bulgaria is still too dependent on Russia, the latter takes advantage of its weakness as if regularly manifest by penetrating the security systems of Sofia's defense sector. As a post-Soviet country, Bulgaria has remained in the political orbit of Russia and its economic influence through the gas sector is weighing on political decisions. Bulgaria's army is in a thought situation and it will therefore require NATO's presence to build its resilience and deterrence vis-a-vis -vis the Russian hybrid war. Also, Turkey is the most important player for NATO and the EU in the Black Sea area due to its geostrategic position and because it aids Ukraine and Georgia's military sectors. Moreover, together with Romania, it advocates for a maritime patrol mission in the Black Sea. However, Turkey, Turkey is not constant in its relationship with NATO as its foreign policy engaged in an ambiguous neutrality. It plays different games depending on its natural interests. In this regard, Turkey has the opportunity to strengthen its military and technological capabilities through its relation with Russia, whose partnership is very valuable in the energy sector as well. The debate around the Black Sea military access is indeed much depending on the role of Turkey 
having an interest in both a defense industrial cooperation with Russia and a more assertive position within the NATO. There's, of course, also an energy economic impact on the security strategies that I will also include in the paper due to limited uh, time available here. So let's move on the dilemmas that we are facing at this moment. When we see uh, the depending on the actor involved, the Black Sea security issues are addressed using different approaches reflecting their core interests. The Black Sea region is addressed as a wider Black Sea region by the US and the transatlantic community. European neighborhood policy by the EU as Russian hybrid tactics represent a threat for Ukraine and Georgia and Black Sea synergy of 2007 indicating the EU main interest in the area. While the previous section have analyzed main security issues by distinguishing sectors and motives, this uh, part will report the main security dilemmas in the region. And experts agree, of course, about NATO's uncoordinated diplomatic strategy towards building tensions and too few capacities or troop deployed. It is not keeping up with the pace. The Russian foreign policy values based on aggressive military actions are hard to change, but its security strategy is in a way predictable, as it points uh, to the occupation of geostrategic littoral countries. A way into the solution, according to experts, would be to have a unified Western military engagement that may increase the possibility to spark the unpredictability that Russia is trying to avoid. To counter Russia, building a robust and unpredictable response is, for this point of view, as important as building and deploying a stronger military capability. So, to conclude my part, I would, um, I would say that there is no doubt that the countries implicated in and around the Black Sea face some significant challenges. Yet uh, the region also presents many opportunities for cooperation and development that are potentially highly beneficial for our parties involved. For the EU at least, the potential in the Black Sea is not only important for its two member states, Romania and Bulgaria, but also for the Union as a whole, especially considering that the Black Sea could play an integral part in this Commission's strive for green renewable energy and energy independence. As for the regional and international organizations in the region, the one that seems the most relevant to security is NATO. It is by far the most important and active organization in the region, uh, though it started to increase its presence just after Russia's annexation of the Crimea. The first step to balance Russian assertiveness was to establish the Bucharest HQ of uh, NTOs, including two force integration units. This necessary action was important because it allows the organization to enhance the security of its southwestern flank, and at the same time, it paved the way for the second step, namely the creation of the Multinational Framework Brigade under the HQ MNDSC. It contributed to increasing the deterrence, defense, as well as posture of the organization in the Black Sea region. However, NATO has not exclusively oriented its efforts to the land domain, but it has also intensified its position in the sea domain with the sea breeze exercise, which takes place every year in the Black Sea. The main issue and dilemmas derive from how the actors involved decide to cooperate or to compete for the economic and security domain of the Black Sea. NATO and the EU remains interested in, in economic and political stabilization, while Russia seeks to develop its economic and military hegemony in Eastern Europe. Turkey is in the middle as it meets the demands of both parts, where it sees potential benefits for itself. The foreign policies adopted by the concerned parties 
will undoubtedly seek to achieve their objectives, even though these policies may lack cohesion and coordination even amongst allies. Accordingly, NATO and the UF, and the EU, sorry, have uh, security policies most centered on a tailored approach, but still lack coordinated and engaging activities with Romania and Bulgaria. Therefore, we agree of the securization of the area that this must become an absolute priority for these actors. With this, I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Director Broken, um, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to our audience today and thank you for your stimulating presentation. Um, as the time is running, um, I will move the, the floor to our next speaker, uh, Professor Gabriel Raikum, uh, to provide his presentation. But before then, I would uh, encourage again uh, the audience to uh, to ask any question using the chat here on the platform. So, Professor Raiku, if you are here with us, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. I would love the, I would like to thank you to organizers, and uh, I will uh, try to start to share my screen. Yeah. It's okay right now. Uh, for uh, I think for all of us, uh, this panel is uh, very important because uh, it has an extraordinary potential for capitalizing uh, on the strategic expertise of the presenters. Uh, for me, it was very interesting, and I am deeply convinced uh, was also very interesting for uh, for all of us. Well. Cybersecurity is a difficult subject that needs to be addressed in a complex way, given the continuous evolution of threats and their nature. There are a multitude of advanced meanings for studying the methods and counteracting security risk in the Black Sea region, especially classical technical risk, but not all. Beyond the well-known risk, there is a possibility of increasing, of transforming uh, them into triggers uh, of accidents and catastrophe by contextual manipulation uh, of different uh, technical, uh, but not only um, through cyber intrusions and so on. Moreover, through the ubiquity of communication systems and uh, mobile devices, even on the bring of your own devices, the senses, the exposed attack surface has been greatly widened in the last decade. For uh, this reason, we start a series of activities uh, to make uh, a lot of uh, awareness activity and uh, a lot of professional hubs related to cybersecurity. Although not all assets are necessarily a direct target for an operational point of view in the context of digital democracy, we remember the possibilities of influencing political perceptions and decision on the different topics like energy topic field that can affect long-term political decisions. And here Romania has uh, uh, its own cases. Uh, today, system of systems become more dependent on digital technology, which face higher risk and vulnerabilities and are exposed to increased cyber threats. For example, uh, most power grids uh, were designed when there were no cyber attacks uh, in their uh, horizon. And as a result, the protection installed later do not completely address cybersecurity issues. As a direct consequence, not all industrial, not all um, systems uh, at large scale can be protected uh, uh, in a proper manner. In fact, uh, although it is important to approach each protection measure, measure perfect, uh, perfectly, all that matters uh, in the end is the ability to prevent the opponent from pursuing their destructive goals. This fact imposes the collective efficiency of all the measures taken and not necessarily the achievement of perfection for each measure itself. 
the main purpose of this approach here is to go beyond checklist thinking. And I will insist uh, on this uh, thing. After all, to be effective, security measures must be adapted to face an opponent that usually has an important informational advantage. Uh, when uh, we are thinking uh, about reality versus uh, practicability, although the classical approach uh, used in cyber defense is a pragmatic one and follows the logic of preventive action, it has the disadvantage that is already a measure considered by attacker who use high predictive capability and thinks of penetration and persistence accordingly. In fact, the most of success of re uh, recent attacks is based uh, uh, on this anticipatory mechanism used by attackers. Moreover, the same mechanism can be used by attackers to sometimes hide behind elements of plausible deniability. To reduce the success of such attacks, the entire chain of events and weaknesses exploited must be considered, including in the defense strategy elements that increase the cost for the attacker and that reduce both his success and the first way to detect and solve the problem. In order to offer advanced protection, major technology were designs where, uh, no, where uh, there was no cyber attacks. Uh, that measures uh, do not completely address cybersecurity today. Elements must, uh, supplemental elements must be considered, including the threats and hybrid nature and the elements of adaptability and exploitability that attackers use, knowing the target standards, ways of reacting in case of cyber incidents. The problem must be seen by defenders as a game in which security must survive and win game after game and not necessary as an event played on a single round. <clears throat> Sorry. Over the last few years, several developments have been observed that have led to traceability of common problems when the perspective of cybersecurity in the Black Sea uh, was erased. There are typical events during the COVID-19 pandemic, for example, underlying the, uh, underlining the importance that must be addressed to communication technology and remote work, as well as the inefficiency of the means of the protection developed in uh, terms of linear outdating thinking of means of protection. In fact, uh, it was not the lack of protection that was the cause of the most disastrous cyber incidents in recent times in our area, but the lack of understanding of the complex mechanism behind them that allowed the attacker to gain advantages. The explanation that led to this global security situation are complex and cannot, uh, and we cannot claim that we can address them fully, but uh, we can consider a series of elements that through synergistic action can explain a series of contexts in which cybersecurity can develop capabilities and resistance in new global context. One can enumerate here a series of findings that have a common element uh, that has have, uh, as a common element a certain heterogeneity that treated individually can be addressed relatively easy but not necessary in the short term. Uh, for example, uh, there are non-alignment of cybersecurity strategies that affect both the response mode, the reaction speed, and the way that defense strategies are, uh, are designed uh, in the near future. It is worth mentioning the situation in which both uh, EU and uh, US, for example, comprehend the importance of implementing cybersecurity standards and certification systems, but the practical approaches in implementation differ substantially. Uh, when we talk about uh, Black Sea, also uh, some other specificities uh, appear in this, uh, in this area. Another, um, another point. Uh, is limited efficiency of early warning system as a common element, especially in the maritime industry, like an example. Uh, the limited efficiency of advanced warning and cyber threat mitigation system is uh, in industrial security needs a closer scrutiny in the future. This includes intrusion detection issues, as well as um, uh, misidentification mis of malign actors, inaccurate list or prioritized uh, priority targets, faulty prediction of courses of, uh, of actions and unrealistic scenario and training events. 
Uh, it is well known that digital democracies advanced industry sector vulnerability. Uh, it's um, a very um, delicate uh, in terms of escalating cyber attacks where there is a recurrence in due to the natural increase in uh, natural increase in access points and complexity of attacks. Um, in digital democracies, uh, we remember the possibility of influencing political perceptions and decisions in the energy field, like I um, uh, said in, uh, in Romania several times ago, that can affect, uh, can affect long term political decisions. Uh, moreover, the most, industrial uh, the most important industrial processes were designed um, uh, earlier uh, in the timeline and uh, as a direct result, the protection installed later uh, do not completely address the cybersecurity issue. Uh, there are also a different uh, direction related to opportunistic exploitation of vulnerability induced by pandemics and natural disasters or other kinds of disasters um, associated with major impact in the regional security. The lack of method to deal with uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, has led uh, to additional logistical complication with the risk of generating either efficiency or even security problems. This type of cyber attacks has various effects. Some need to be investigated and understood and deeply understood as an older technology and legacy system were deployed um, uh, earlier uh, on uh, technical development pipeline. Another, uh, another um, uh, dangerous situation uh, is generated by the lack of adequate and adaptable responses at technical and strategical level in case of hybrid attacks. Protection and responses have limited efficiency, requiring uh, new approaches and greater adaptability to meet the evolutionary threats in our um, uh, Black Sea region. There is a need for new security approaches to detect and prevent threats while building protection against cyber and privacy attacks. Uh, Microgrid operations here and uh, in landing or ice landing could be a further exploit against cyber attacks and cascading effects like in the uh, supply chain or logistic uh, field could appear. When uh, a paradigm shifts is needed, uh, like in classical versus holistic approach in cybersecurity, several methods and means that are better suited to the development and the evolution of real-time events must be considered. Uh, it can uh, uh, take in consideration that the hope for a cyber attack to be completely rejected is utopian, considering the determination of some attackers and the information and capabilities they have. In fact, the, the, uh, a sufficiently determined attacker with almost unlimited capabilities at his disposal can succeed against any measure that a private economic actor or uh, institution uh, can consistently take uh, in due time. For this point of view, holistic approaches to cybersecurity are beginning to be justified both st statistically and as a balance um, between investment and efficiency. Thus, uh, we can consider means and methods by which the cost that the attacker must consider for the invasion of the cyber protection system are higher than the efficiency of the attack itself. Um, the classical approach to cybersecurity that must be nuances in which is considered that uh, if the complete blocking of cyber attack is not successful, then the protection measure is not effective at all. In reality, things must be nuanced and uh, we must understand the way things are played. Fortunately for the defenders, there is also a series of cost and investments on the part of the attackers, which if they are high enough, will induce the idea of inefficiency and will lead to the abandonment of the attacks and to the apparent diminution of the attack surface. Obviously, such an approach with, uh, will signal both uh, parts, the security issue, and um, offer the defenders uh, the time and the uh, aims and tools uh, to mitigate uh, and fix the problem. Although not necessarily new, this approach assumes that no effective measure can be said to have failed. 
if substantially increases the attacker cost or reduces his benefit of success is discouraging uh, um, him from returning uh, second time. The optimal combination of these protective effects open us a whole uh, new realm of defensive actions that have been previously neglected. Normally, these approaches are considered difficult, difficult to legally frame and are omitted usually, preferring the mechanical approaches in which a checklist prevails, which is very easy to neutralize by the uh, skilled attackers. The holistic approach, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, through its non-linearity uh, non uh, has the advantage of including a series of security elements from the category of those on which discretion mass must be maintained. They also involve a series of higher costs due to the creativity necessary to, oper uh, to operation and the need to address specifically to the environment they need to protect. Taken as a word, Holistic uh, security measures aim to increase attackers' cost and include means and methods by which attacks can be detected at the cost of small losses while providing defenders with time and the means to counteract and avoid losing control or leaking important information and the chances to detect new undocumented, uh, totally undocumented um, kind of uh, attacks where heuristics uh, on where normal heuristics uh, cannot signaling uh, a risk at all in fact the same uh, hybrid character that managed to achieve success in terms of attackers tools against them by exploiting measures on the adaptability of defender uh, defenders uh, part there is a major tendency to disguise a series of uh, cybersecurity attacks on a major infrastructure as ransomware attacks or attacks that include an excluded component in the area of economic profitability within cybercrime groups. The roots of these behaviors can be found in the last decade with important moments during the attacks uh, on the logistic and supply chain. Some of, them, uh, some of them being still uh, active in the early 2021. Uh, you remember maybe uh, the Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack. There are also some risks in the um, uh, Black Sea area. These actions have a character of, of, uh, of offering the, that plausible deniability, an element that highlights the degree of refinement that cyber attacks have reached today. Um, you can see here, for example, in this slide, the cyber fuzzy fencing synoptical diagram. It's a different approach, it's rather different than classical approach and aims and promises to have uh, a greater efficiency in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this field of activity. Um, well, uh, considering the theoretical elements previously stated, we can introduce the experimental concept of cybersecurity fencing um, and uh, where cybersecurity is inextricably linked to technological evolution and human behavior. The intrinsic, that intrinsic dependence on technology and the major geopolitical context of the last decade has transformed an area where technical and human errors were to some extent tolerating until now into a battlefield between economic interest and spheres of geopolitical influence. For digital democracies to be able to further assert their values, a paradigm shift is needed, considering new developments, new developments in the uh, approach to cybersecurity. Uh, I think uh, it's very important also to move from the mechanical procedural approach to an adaptive immune-like system um, when, uh, where um, the response of the cyber defense system can be asymmetrized and deplete the opponent's resources, the attacker's resources, adopting effective defense measures against attack that tends to exploit the mixture and aggressive creativity of existing technical vulnerability. In fact, uh, uh, in fact, uh, we can say that the effect of cyber disasters in the last year are primarily due to the creativity approach and less to the technical vulnerability that were present for a long time anyway. 
Uh, here, for example, you can see a uh, situation uh, over the Ankara airport two weeks ago uh, when uh, a circle of uh, maritime ships appears uh, in a sort uh, of a very strange situation because uh, they tend to um, circulate around the building, the administrative building of the Ankara airport. And uh, that status uh, was present uh, from um, uh, several hours. Uh, today, it's a little uh, stable situation, but uh, anyhow, even today, there are two ships and uh, one voice which, are, which is uh, present uh, in, in this area um, uh, in the same uh, strange situation. When we try to uh, put it on the map, you can see on the large map, uh, large scale map, you can see here the um, point of interest and how things uh, can, uh, can work and uh, the potential problems which uh, they can um, uh, Cost. If we uh, made some uh, tracking on the um, uh, pathway map, we can observe the direction of this, uh, this uh, incidence uh, in a short time. But uh, that was uh, one uh, single example. There are uh, many examples in different time frames and, uh, and uh, in different uh, areas uh, in the Black Sea Basin. Uh, in uh, such a way where uh, the problems could uh, escalate uh, in a dangerous way. Uh, to conclude, uh, or instead of conclusions, uh, to be very accurate, uh, security in the Black Sea area is, uh, is of major importance for regional and global stability in terms of limited geopolitical strategy predictability. Due to the factors that are difficult to predict and control in the short and medium term, situations that led to this global security situation are complex, and we cannot claim that we can address them fully. It's unrealistic, but we can consider a series of elements that, who, uh, that uh, through synergistic action, can explain a series of contexts in which cybersecurity can develop capabilities and resistance in new global contexts. Cybersecurity is essentially an element with low predictability, despite recent sustained global efforts, especially in areas where regional conflicts are unclear and constantly changing in situations when allies on certain interests are in conflict on other geostrategic directions. It can be considered that the hope for a cyber attack to be completely rejected is utopian. Uh, considering the detonation of some attackers and the, the information capabilities they have. Uh, holistic approaches to cybersecurity are beginning to be justified, both statistically and as a balance, uh, balanced balance between investment and efficiency, like I said earlier. A paradigm sh uh, shift uh, also is needed to abandon the classical ch checklist thinking and move to an innovative level with uh, the new abilities to adapt and react almost instantaneously to threats from hostile regional or, uh, or even distant uh, actors. Uh, in fact, the resilience in terms of cybersecurity, it's an uh, ongoing process. It's a successfully planned uh, process insofar as is limited to the present capability of estimation and prediction. For an advanced security being necessary, a holistic approach, a more broader uh, knowledge in which the classical elements are permanently assisted by innovative innovative uh, approaches uh, and uh, real-time inputs. I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm deeply open to any kind of question and uh, comments and uh, discussions um, uh, next uh, in the next moments uh, and so. Thank you.
Can you hear me now? Okay, sorry for that. So I would say again, uh, I would say again, thank you very much, Professor Raiku, for your presentation and the great work uh, you are doing at the Maritime University in Constanza by promoting such a comprehensive perspective on cybersecurity in the region. And uh, finally, last but not least, I would invite uh, Dr. George T. Bill to provide his presentation. George, the floor is yours, please, uh, for the, for the uh, next 10 minutes. George, can you hear me? Gentlemen, can you hear me? Oh, okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Tibil, we can't hear you. Dr. Tibil, are you here with us? Dr. Tibil, can you turn on your microphone, please? We can hear you. Dr. Tibil, can you hear us? I can notice on the screen that uh, your mic is turned on, but unfortunately, we can't hear you anymore. Can you check the microphone again, please? I think that you could try to uh, connect again. Would you like to do it? It takes only a few seconds and maybe after that it will work. Sorry for the inconveniences. So this is the virtual world in which uh, we live nowadays, unfortunately. This pandemic, even though brought so many of us together using such kind of platforms, from time to time we experience such kind of challenges, you know. Even though we are very familiar with such, uh, with this kind of um, um, technology, uh, from time to time it turns against us. And uh, this is another important security concern we have nowadays, as Professor Raiko mentioned before, together with the cybersecurity realm, there are also other technologies growing nowadays, and uh, we have to understand how to deal with them 
just to be sure that uh, we can use them properly, not to be threatened by them. Anyway, so if uh, you can hear me, jo uh, Georgia, please uh, send me a message just to be sure that uh, we can um, we can see your presentation. Um, if not, uh, before. Um, yeah, yeah, good. Now, can you hear me? Please try again to say something. I can, I can hear you. The the connection is so weak. I I, I don't understand. Unfortunately, yeah. you're right. So you hear me now? Uh, Doctor Tibili is in Brussels right now, so um, maybe the distance is also an you issue. Okay. Yes. Oh yeah. Brussels and the connection is is big. Can Unfortunately, we cannot understand what uh, you are saying, Georgia. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I also believe that the next most important critical developments with the impact on the European security. In context, my presentation will focus on the maybe now. Maybe now? Now it's better. Is it now to speak or can hear Yes. Oh. Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> Do you hear me here now, Nico? Or is this not working? Unfortunately, connection is really bad, Georgia. So we can't hear you. There are a lot of turbulences here. It's difficult to understand anything else you yeah. try to tell uh, us. Okay. Can I can I my presentation? Yes. Oh. Uh, Fortunately, it, it doesn't work, you know. Intention is short plans security. Okay. I don't know. Uh, George, if you agree with that, I will try to conclude the panel today because we are closing to the end of this session in this morning. Uh, 
I don't know understand. I don't understand what's happening. So as you are the last speaker today, George, if you can hear me, I would suggest to pass over your presentation. Uh, you already sent it to the um, organizers, so they have your presentation. And uh, I will try to conclude okay. a little bit this session. Do you agree with that? Just text me if you if you can. Send me a message. You so can. You still can help me. So sorry for that, ladies and gentlemen. I would suggest to to end this panel now. I mean, uh, just to briefly conclude uh, what our uh, very um, very distinguished panels uh, panelists um, um, uh, told us today. So I've made a list of notes here. Uh, um, uh, from the speeches in this morning, and I would say I would uh, briefly conclude that uh, in the Black Sea, regional security cannot be approached outside the national security concepts of the littorals of the littoral states. From historical perspective, Black Sea has been a confrontation zone, a bridge between civilization, and it is considered a major crossroad and critical intersection of uh, east-west and the south-north corridors. The security environment in the wider Black Sea region is rapidly changing. It combines prolonged conflicts with a significant conventional military buildup that in intensified after 2014. Uh, um, as a result, there is a blurring of peace, crisis, and conflict conditions in the region in this context, there is a pressing need to develop a clearer understanding of the Black Sea region's security dynamics and challenges and explore opportunities for dialogue between, uh, between the key regional security actors. Uh, the Black Sea represents a region of vulnerability for the eastern flank of NATO. NATO cannot allow Russia or any other assertive adversary to threaten its presence at the Black Sea, or the alliance may lose its credibility as a common defense organization. Russia uh, behaves as a, re a revisionist actor and is seeking to establish a sphere of privileged influence over neighboring countries in the region and limit their integration into your Atlantic structures and or NATO, while enhancing its regime stability and improving military capabilities for defense and power projection from this region abroad, um, beyond. Um, NATO and partner countries from the Black Sea region face common security challenges and ought to develop a common security agenda even though they have been faced uh, challenges to build an active multi-dimensional multi security posture. And uh, together with the security per se, the normative elements, uh, we need a comprehensive and wider security approach as deterring Russia is rather reactive than proactive. Romania is a NATO member state and a regional security player has incre increased military uh, spendings and investments and particularly improved its air force capabilities, enhancing NATO security posture and acting as a security provider in the region. Moreover, Moldova is still a big regional consumer of security. Moldova's close relation with Romania is very important in the security field. Romania can provide unconditional, immediate, and concrete security support to the Republic of Moldova in various security issues as terrorists, hybrid threats, and other issues of major security concern. Energy remains a core security issue in the, in the Black Sea region. 
also cyber security is a critical issue with low predictability especially in areas where tensions are high and regional conflicts are blurred and constantly changing as this region here with almost unlimited um, cyber capabilities at his disposal an assertive actor can succeed against any measure um, uh, that a private or institutional actor uh, can consistently take. Therefore, in this, in this realm, a paradigm shift is needed to abandon the classic checklist thinking approach and move to an innovative level with an ability to adapt and react almost in, um, immediately to threats from hostile regional or even distant actors. Furthermore, we have learned today that the EU, European Union, has experienced some setbacks in the Black Sea region and in, in uh, its eastern neighborhood over the last years. These evolutions have shown the limits of its approach to the region. There are at least two examples in this respect, the power transition arrangements uh, arrangement in Belarus and the full-scale military conflict in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh without any involvement of the EU or its member states, at least in my view. Uh, can the EU do more for overall Black Sea security? The answer seems to be affirmative. In this regard, there are some required actions to be undertaken, starting with an authentic development of the partnership um, basket, um, the strat strategic compass, and the um, sound representation of the Eastern partnership in this basket. Still, uh, in its discussions on security threats to the strategic compass, the EU should uh, be bold and include a strong focus on uh, Black Sea security, which complements NATO's complex security approach. And um, adding some um, hard power ingredients into the EU soft power approach and the, strength, uh, the strengthening of the future uh, um, CSDP, um, at least uh, its uh, crisis management missions in the region, uh, both in terms of uh, mandates and resources, there are also useful avenues to be followed. And last but not least, Maintaining the internal unity in the strategic confrontation with Russia in the medium and long run is key for successful involvement in the Black Sea region. So, ladies and gentlemen, that being said, and being almost a quarter past 11, I would suggest to end this panel here today. I want to thank all speakers for their impressive contribution to the panel. Um, dear panelists, you definitely deserve a round of virtual round of applauses. Thank you very much for being here with us today and sharing such thoughtful contributions to this very critical debate uh, regarding such a um, um, uh, critical region as the Black Sea. Thank you all for your attention and have a nice day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.